And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let all the ladies know uh, which one's husband showed up tonight. <laughs> So, ladies, you said you were going to be watching tonight, so um, you should be proud of your husbands. Most of them are here, okay? <laughs> and uh, we, we're just really grateful that you're here tonight, and we trust that you're going to receive more uh, from the um, Bible, basically. And uh, it's always a joy to teach it because it just really is so much information and um, in a way that's very understandable and um, to be able to put it in order. But before we go to the Lord uh, tonight, um, I just want to make mention, um, Sister Janie, uh, most of you know Angie's mother, uh, she had a stroke uh, yesterday, and she's at the Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas. Uh, so we're going to pray for her. And then some of you may uh, know Kathy Pavitt. Uh, they come uh, at different times. Uh, their little... Her little grandson is Marcus, is about maybe four or five, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, they took him to Children's Hospital this morning um, with um, asthmatic bronchitis, I believe is what they called it, and uh, his oxygen count was really down, and uh, so they took him there uh, this, this morning. And so I just want us to remember both of them in prayer, uh, that God will keep his hands upon them and uh, that they can receive a healing touch from the Lord. And uh, so let's all bow our heads tonight, and we're just going to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much tonight for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for the healing power of Christ. And, Lord, we just bring Angie before you this evening, and we bring um, Marcus before you. And, Lord, we just ask that you're... Your healing power will touch them, and Lord, that they, they will be made whole. And Father, we bind the sickness, we bind any assignment that the enemy has uh, against these, and Lord, we just speak healing and peace and victory in their life tonight, and we give you all the praise for that in the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. And also, Tina, it just come to my mind, Tina, she fell and, and hurt herself quite badly, uh, her back and that, and she was going to go with the ladies, but she had to back out of it. So, uh, Father, we just again lift up Tina before you, and Lord, ask that you would just be with her and heal her, touch her, strengthen the back, the muscle tissues, the bones, every, any area that might have been damaged, Lord, we just speak peace into that area and healing into that area, and we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Huh. Oh, Sandy, that's right, you mentioned that. Well, let's pray again. <laughs> All, right. All right. Father, we pray for Sandy right now. And Lord, um, whatever happened to his back today, uh, Father, just put it right back in place. And Lord, let there not be any long-term uh, issues with it. Uh, Lord, just totally, completely healed by the power of Jesus. Amen and amen. And God has been good to us. And for those of you who've been kind of wondering about uh, the van and all that kind of stuff, uh, should be here uh, Friday. I got a call today and uh, about 2 o'clock, and every, it's in Dallas, so it's going to be here in a few more days. So thank you for praying. Uh, it came from Oregon, so we're going to have to pray that left coast spirit off of it, all right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, it, it's on its way, and we're very, very grateful and excited about all the different ways we'll be able to utilize it in that. So, are you ready to praise the Lord tonight? Worship God. Get into His Word. Amen. Amen. God has been good to us. So let's all stand. We're going to worship the Lord tonight. Amen. So ladies, those of you in Galveston that are watching, don't sit in those comfortable couches and sing. We stand up also, and let's worship the Lord together.
seated amen we'll uh we'll let our youth be uh go up uh we'll go with brother kenny and them tonight and our children uh some children's church and uh god has been good to us and we're very happy with all that he's doing i'm glad that you're here tonight well praise god more coming in marty he got here <laughs> They told me they were going to be watching, Marty. <laughs> hey. Yeah, okay. It was your fault. You weren't here to come and quit working, okay? All right. Well, we're, we're glad that each of you are here. And obviously, maybe we'd have sang a couple more songs, Crystal. They're all coming in now. <laughs> oh, you're going to sit up front. Okay. Amen. Well, we're glad each of you are here tonight. And... Um, I hope you were looking at your, your notebooks uh, or your, your book this week. Uh, tonight we're going to actually get kind of into a few thoughts. And um, one of the things that um, if you have your book with you, if you have your handouts from last week, um, one of the areas, and if you forgot your book, there's another one over here. Uh, but if you forgot your book and you need to use one over here, that's great. But make sure you leave it here. And that way it'll be there next week when you forget your book again. <laughs> all right. He gave all yours out. All right. Um, on the study help number eight, uh, it's on the back of your uh, handout from last week. Uh, this is it's kind of a, like a fabric when you weave together. And basically what the whole Word of God is, is summed up right here on that picture of that little basket weave web uh, on the very, I think it's the very last, number eight is what it says, seminar study help number eight. All right, so what, what it happens is this gives you a whole idea of the entire Word of God, okay? And uh, the C, obviously, we're going to start tonight. The C that you'll see there going up and down is creation, and we're going to talk about the creation tonight. Then the A stands for Abraham, and then you have Joseph, Moses, and Joshua. And those are the three or four individuals that play a really important part in the book of Genesis. And it also plays a very important part for you and I because this is the ones that are going to receive the promise and the covenant from God that's going to transfer down to you and I ultimately, okay? And after that, there's three periods, and you'll see the A, R, and C. And the A is the anarchy, and that's going to be a period of time when all the judges ruled. Uh, Israel was in a royal mess, um, and... They would, uh, we call it a sin cycle, okay? And what a sin cycle is, everyone, once I tell you what it is, you'll, you'll probably understand, and you might even say something to the point like, yeah, I got caught up in that myself, all right? A sin cycle is, is that it's basically everything is going wrong. Nothing is going right. And the enemy is overtaking you. The enemy is destroying your crops. 
Uh, they're pillaging your villages. And for you and I, it might be stealing our joy, stealing our faith and our confidence, and just reaping havoc on our homes and our families and our kids. And all of a sudden, we cry out. And we go, God, I need help. All right? I can't do this by myself. Nobody in this room has been there, right? To where we've, we've cried out for help. And God, being merciful the way he is, he raised up a judge, and he raised up someone, and they would come in, and man, they would defeat the enemy. God would wipe them out and destroy everything against Israel, and all of a sudden, everything was fine. And man, they worshiped God, served God, gave him everything that they could. Well, everything was good now, all right? Everything was running great. Everything, everybody was happy. Well, we don't really need God right now because everything's going okay. So they walked away from God. And they ended up getting right back into the same place they were before. They cried out once again. And God would raise up another judge. And we'll go through them individually later. He'd raise up another judge. And, uh, and they would defeat the enemy. Everything would go really good for a period of time. They, you know, just started getting, I guess if I could use that word, uh, they started getting a little cocky and thinking, I can do this on my own. I don't need you, Lord. And sure enough, they would get right back into the same situation over again. Now, I can parallel that today, and so can you. We can parallel that uh, today with people who come to church and they don't come to church when everything is upside down in their life. They want help. They come ask God for help. God gets them out of a situation. And I, I liken it kind of like to a foxhole. Uh, I'm in this foxhole. Lord, if you get me out of here alive, I promise you when I go home back to America, I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. I'm, there's no if and buts about it. Well, God gets you out of the foxhole, you come back to America, you go to church for a little while, and everything seems to be okay for a period of time, and then guess what? You forget all about what God did for you. Well, that was the anarchy that was going on. There was about 13 of the different uh, judges that will rule uh, over a period of time. And then the R is royalty, and that's, that's going to be the kings, okay? That's going to be... Uh, first of all, you're going to have David, then you're going to have um, a Saul first. Saul, David, and Solomon. And that's going to be called the royal period. And there's going to be a lot of things that take place during that period. And then you have the sea. And the sea means captivity. And that's what's going to happen. Israel is going to turn away from God so much to a point that God is going to allow them to be taken captive and there's going to be 10 out of the 12 tribes are going to be dispersed up into an area called uh, up in the northern area, Syria. And we're never going to hear from them again. They're gone, okay? And there'll be two tribes down in the southern part, and that'll be uh, Judah and Benjamin. And they're only going to be in captivity for about 70 years. And then God is going to raise up Nehemiah, Ezra, Zerubbabel, and they're going to bring them back to Israel, but it's going to take about a hundred and something years for it to happen. They're going to come back in three different groupings, and that's where we begin to read the stories about what God was doing to restore Israel and allow her to build her temple again. So all of that's going to take place in that captivity. But then all of a sudden, and this is just a really quick one, all of a sudden, God gets silent. Now, how many of you have ever felt that God didn't hear your prayer? Anybody? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. How many of you have ever made statements like, you know, I, I just haven't helped, felt uh, God speaking to me now for a, a couple of weeks, or it's been a month since God's really spoke to my heart. Have you ever, ever been in that kind of a situation? <laughs> Can you imagine not hearing from God for over 400 years? 400 years. God said, I'm silent. I'm not going to speak to you. I'm not going to direct you. 
You have forsaken me. You have went after all the false gods. You've done all of these things. So I'm not going to, I'm just not going to talk to you now. How many of you know that when God sometimes seems silent, that he might be doing work on your behalf that you don't know? Oh, during the silent period, what we're going to find out is that God was raising up. You ever hear, you ever hear of this character uh, in uh, school called Alexander the Great? Uh-huh. God was raising up Alexander the Great. He was uh, 32, I think, when he committed suicide, if I'm not mistaken. All right. He was... God raised him up. You know why he raised him up? Anybody have an idea of why God would raise up someone like Alexander the Great? How many of you know that God has a plan and a program for your life that you probably don't know about? Well, here's what Alexander the Great was doing. He was conquering the world. All right? And Alexander the Great is going to do a couple of odd things that seem out of character. He's going to take the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures... And he's going to translate them into what we call the Septuagint. And that's the first time that the Hebrew Scriptures had ever been translated. He's going to build an incredible library at Alexandra, up up right by Cairo in in Africa there. And he's going to begin to uh, create a common language. And it's going to be the Greek language. So now all of a sudden, John, people from all kinds of background are going to be able to communicate one with another. And they hadn't been able to do that since when? The Tower of Babel. God confused the language. Now Alexander is going to give us one language, and that's going to be the Greek language. So God was using him, and he was even though he was silent to Israel... He was making everything ready for when his son was going to come into the world. Then, after that, then we have another individual, well, not so much individual as much as a, a, a nation. We had the Roman government come in. And during this period, Rome began to do something. Did you know that Rome actually built a highway from Rome all the way through uh, Europe? Do you know it would be that very highway that ultimately the disciples would travel and take the message? Do you know we received a calendar? We received a, a, a common currency? And uh, so many areas that we received during that time. So what I'm trying to tell you is that even though it seemed like God was not talking, even though it seemed like God was silent, God was literally moving a mountain. And why is that important? Because every one of us in this room, there have been times when we felt that God didn't hear us anymore or that God was on a vacation and uh, he might get around to us somewhere down the road. But all the time that it seemed like God was silent and nothing was being done in our life, God was literally moving mountains for you in your life. So at the right time, God could look at you and say, I've got everything in place. I've got everything in motion now for you to move forward and do what I've asked you to do and do what I've called you to do. And we think sometimes God doesn't understand us or God doesn't hear us. And all the time. So we, we move up to the silent period. And the J stands for the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we're going to look at uh, the life of Christ. We're going to look at the church. We're going to look at the epistles uh, of Paul. And then we're going to also look at Revelation. Then when Jesus gets ready to come back, we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we're going to have the second coming of Christ. Then there'll be a thousand year reign with Christ. And then there'll be the great white throne judgment. And then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And everything that God has done, all the way from Genesis to Revelation now, is played out. And you have it right there in your hands. All right? 
Now, there's four different weaves that go horizontal. Now, we talked a little bit last week about the call of Abraham. And that covenant goes all the way through the Word of God, all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament. And that covenant is going to be kept when Jesus returns back for Abraham and for all of us, okay? That covenant never, ever stops. So it goes all the way from that time. But if you begin to look like during the time of Moses, God began to give a land covenant. And he began to let people realize, I'm giving you a land. I'm making you a nation to Abraham especially. And then we're going to find out that when David comes to rule, there will be a divinity covenant. This is a covenant where the seed is made promise unto uh, Israel that God is going to raise up Jesus Christ in order to redeem all mankind. And then ultimately, there will be a brand new covenant. What is the new covenant? What is it? It's the New Testament. But what is in the new covenant? Hmm? Okay. Anybody else? What, what, is, what is in the new covenant? Yeah, what is in the new covenant? By grace? Okay. Trip, what's in the new covenant? Okay. You see what's in the new covenant for you? Okay. There's, there's so much that was made available to you and I. Now, where's the new covenant going to be written? Remember in the Old Testament, they were written on stones. It's going to be written on your heart. And that's the power of understanding the new covenant. See, you could not keep the 613 different laws. I mean, it was 613, I think it was, wasn't it? You couldn't keep them. Man could not do it. Matter of fact, Paul's going to tell us in the New Testament, he said the law was to let you know you couldn't keep the law. So it was a schoolmaster to bring us to a place in Christ. All right? I mean, you've got two laws that you and I are asked to be obedient to. Somebody tell me what they are. All right. Love God. Love your neighbor. Isn't it amazing? I have people tell me that that we need to keep all 613 of the laws, and I'm saying we can't even keep two. I mean, we have a hard time loving our neighbor. Uh, listen, people tell me all the time they love God, but there's a lot of times people tell me they love God, but they surely don't show it because God's certainly not first place in their life. I love my wife, and apart from God, she is number one in my life. Well, what about your kids? Well, they're number 10 and 12 and 13. <laughs> all right. All right. My, my, my wife, all right, apart from God, she... She's number one, all right? Am I making any points, baby? <laughs> she's, she's everything. And when people say, well, I love God, and God isn't everything in their life, what we're saying is, yeah, I really don't put him first in my life. Well, if we don't put him first, then we don't really have a genuine love. What we're looking for is kind of like fire insurance, all right? Get me out of a spot, get me out of a bind, help me get over something that I'm going through. But we have to put him number one in our life. So that becomes the new covenant in our heart. It's written inside, okay? Nancy and I have worked in places to where uh, if a woman commits adultery, She is immediately, when she's convicted, she is taken out. There is a hole that is dug. She is put into that hole up to her neck. And the village comes out and they pick up stones and they stone her until she's dead. All right? That is 
the reality still today in the world in which we live in. And a lot of people fear God, all right? And they fear hell. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned and fear hell. We, none of us should want to go there. We want to do everything to avoid it. But if I only love God for what he does for me only, and I don't return that love back to him, then I really truly can't say that I love God with all my heart and with all my mind and my spirit. So I end up understanding that we love for different reasons, okay? In marriages, a lot of times, we love one another for maybe security, or we love one another for uh, companionship. Uh, we love one another because of physical attractions or physical beauty, sums of that nature. Sometimes uh, people love each other because uh, um, they, they just need that financial help. Uh, they can't make it on their own, so they marry someone that they think is going to be able to provide for them and nurture them. So we marry for a lot of reasons, but the, the understanding, and, and even in marriage, Everything that we do, we marry one another, or we should marry one another, because it's designed by God. Because God has a plan and a purpose for your marriage and for your relationship. And God wants to do something with that. So we marry one another because, not of the external things, but we marry because we have a heart to give. Okay? And I've heard all kinds of, of statements and things made and I have come to an understanding of what I believe love is, and especially between a man and a woman. It is fulfilling the plan of God for that marriage. That's what real love is. And if I see that God has something in Nancy's life that he wants to do in her life, if I love her, I'm not gonna be selfish and want my own thing done. I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure her heart's desire or whatever she is called of God to do, to do. That's what love is based on. It's based on giving, not receiving all the time. And so the new covenant is based on giving. It's based on God says that I'm going to write this on your heart. And that you're going to love me and give yourself to me, not because I've got some kind of strings and I'm holding you over an open fire pit called hell, but yet you're loving me back because I'm God and you love me for who that I am. And that's the biggest problem today uh, in, in a lot of situations is we've not yet learned to love people for who they are. Well, we'll look at individuals and, and we'll judge and we'll put preconceived ideas and we love them only if they meet certain criterias. And the scripture is telling us that we love God because it's on our heart to love him. So we're going to explore that a whole lot more, all right? So if you look at this web that's being weaved here, it's going to go all the way from Genesis to revelation, to eternity. And it's all going to be in, interwoven with the covenants that God has made with man. And most importantly, the covenant that he made with you. And you belong to him. So now, if you'll turn into your book, I want you to look at page number 17. Now, if you've got a pencil, great, because you can pencil this in as you go. Uh, if you don't, uh, it will be on the next pages, over a few. Uh, but tonight, I want to look at the first Bible file, all right? This is this number C, okay? The first Bible file, the beginning, is the creation file folder. Before being filled in, the file looks like that on the right. There's nothing there. As with every file in this file system, we will move quickly through the creation folder. Now, I want you to look in the Bible uh, in Genesis chapter number 1, and I want us to look at verse number 1. 
And as we look at this verse, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. Now, why, why would that verse be so powerful for you? I want you, to, I want you to look at it and really think about it, okay? Because what we're going to look at in creation, God was showing us something very, very powerful. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And when he created heaven and earth, the earth didn't have any form. It was void. Nothing was there. And then the scripture says, the spirit of God began to move. Now, how many of you realize when you got saved, when you came to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's an his spirit now came on the inside of you, all right? The very presence, power, and spirit of God now dwells on the inside of you. Now, look at that for a moment. Think about it. Inside of you, all right? Take your finger and point to yourself. Say, inside of me is the very power of the Spirit of God that moved over all of the earth and caused everything to be. Now, when people talk to me and they say, well, Pastor Paul, I don't believe in healing today. I think that all passed away when the last apostle died. I look at this particular verse in Genesis, and I let them know, I want you to understand, when I came to God and when Christ came into my life, the fullness of the power of God came on the inside of me, and that power was able to speak out over all of the darkness, and I'm telling you what, trees came up, and and the the grass and the flowers and the shrubs and the fish and the the deer and the uh, everything the sky and the sun and the moon and the stars out by the power of the spirit of god all of that came into being and the scriptures lets us know that it's that same spirit that now dwells on the inside of you well, if that same spirit is on the inside of me and it created all the things around about me, then why can't I believe that it can create, John, a brand new heart? Why can't I believe that it can create brand new eyes or brand new ears? It moved on the earth and there was nothing and all of a sudden there was everything. And that same spirit dwells on the inside of you. So why would it be out of the realm of impossibility for God still to be able to move like that in your life and my life every day? I don't think we understand what really happened to us when we got saved. We got forgiven of our sin, but man, that's the tip of the iceberg. Because now we have the fullness, and Romans 8 uh, tells us I think it's 8 11, that that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, rolled away the stone, now dwells in you and will quicken your mortal body. So that, I mean, that power is on the inside of me. And I believe the church has lost sight of that power that still dwells in us. And it's that power that enables us to, to reach out. But in this first one, as you begin to look at page number 18, look, what happened in creation? The first man and the first woman. Now, I'm going to ask a very difficult question. Who were they? <laughs> there you go. Adam and who? All right, Adam and Eve. Now, I'm not going to go anywhere else with that. All right, Adam and Eve. God created them. 
Now, he had a job for them. And if we continue to look into the book of Exodus, or Genesis rather, and we go over a little bit, God begins to tell them that they were to be husbandmen. Uh, verse number 22, God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the sea, and let the birds multiply in the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, and there was a fifth day. And then God said, Let all the creatures come forth. So he asked them to do a couple of things. He said, Be fruitful and multiply. And then in another place he says, Take dominion over the land. Now, take dominion means to take care of it. Now, we've not done the best job of that, all right? And because we've not done the best job of that, uh, our climate, our environment is suffering in different directions, okay? Now, I'm not uh, a conspiracist on the climate theory or anything like that. All I'm saying is there's a lot of things that we've done to our environment that has not helped it or nor benefited it. And we were given the responsibility to take care of this earth and this world, and we should have been doing that all along. So the first man and first woman. Man appears on the earth in a perfect form. He's placed in a sinless environment of God's created perfection. Can you imagine living in a, a perfect environment? Everything is there, done, for you, you don't got to do anything. All you got to do is get up in the morning. God provides the food. He comes down in the cool of the day and talks to you, walks with you in the garden. Everything is perfect. And God just said, I just want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to take dominion of the earth. I've made it for you. And sometimes we fail to realize what God has put in our hands and our responsibility to, to do everything we can to take care of what God's given us. Now the first sin comes in. So man is given a test of his gift of free will. He is tempted by Satan he falls from his created state of perfection into a sinful condition, having missed the mark for which he was created. Now, Eve gets a bad, Eve gets a pretty bad rap here, okay? And we are always quick to say Eve, all right? Or today we say, you know, like Eve, uh, Adam did that woman you gave me, all right? All right. It still plays out, all right? But you got to understand, the command was not given to Eve. The command was given to Adam. It was his responsibility to turn to Eve and says, no way. No, God said no. And I'm not going to break the command that God gave me. Now, for the men, I want you to understand, there are things in the scripture that really falls on you as a man. Do you know that there's nowhere in the word to where women are commanded to love their husband? You're to respect them and you're to honor them. But the command has been given to the man, love your wife. And to love your wife so much that it is a reflection of how I, Christ, love the church and is willing to give my life and die for the church. That's how you're to love her. Well, my wife don't love me. She's not commanded to love you. Ladies, that's your time to applaud, all right? <laughs> <laughs> But you are commanded to respect and to honor. It's pretty, pretty powerful. Every principle you're going to find in the New Testament 
at some point had probably been established already in the Word of God. In the very beginning. So we we begin to realize the first sin. Now why was it a sin for them to eat of the tree? God told them not to. Now what how many trees were they that was two main trees in the garden? What were they? Tree of life. Then there's just a tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. And he told them, the day that you eat of that tree, or if, you're going, if you eat of that tree, you are going to what? Die. die. Well, Adam and them, they lived to be 900 years old. But they died a spiritual death that day when they partook of the fruit. All right? Satan uses a cunning way of getting at them. So Satan goes to them and just simply, or Eve and just simply says, you know what? I know, I know what you're telling me, Eve, that God said you shouldn't eat of that, but that's really not what God said. What God really said is that you would not die. Now, isn't it amazing what one word can do? God says you will, and the enemy says you will not. And Eve went ahead and she partook of it, and she enticed Adam also. And he took it. Now they had to be driven out of the garden. And an angel had to be placed in the entrance of that garden to keep them from coming back. Why? They wouldn't live eternally in sin. They would not be able to get back to the tree of life. Because if they were able to eat of the tree of life, they would have continued to live. And that would have been a contradiction to what God said. And they would continually be in sin. Now, isn't that amazing? Because in the New Testament, we're going to find out that Jesus comes. Jesus gives his life for you and I on the cross. Why? So we would not continually have to live in sin. So he's letting us know right from the very get-go, I've got a plan, okay? And my plan is I don't want anybody to be totally separated from me and my father. I don't want you to live in sin. I'm going to make a way for you to be free from that. Adam did it. That sin nature, that rebellious spirit that they had is something that's kind of birthed on the inside of you. And I'm going to eradicate that, but I I can't do it because only death can really eradicate that. So I've got to find somebody who's willing to die in order for it to be eradicated. And I searched all through heaven, and whom do I find? I find Jesus, my only begotten son, and I say, are you willing to go and die that that sin might be eradicated and they will not have to live continually in a state of sin? Isn't that amazing? So incredible. And all of this is right out of the gate. This is out of, I mean, right from the beginning. That God is setting up principles for you and I. And in a, another chapter, we're going to find out before we finish tonight something else that had great. So now we look at the first gospel. All right? The Creator provided the first announcement that He would send the Redeemer to provide for man a way back to the original state of created perfection, innocence, and holiness. There's there's a teaching, and and, uh, it's in the ISA material, that God's design for you is not for you just to be free from sin, but for you to be able to be changed and go back before sin ever happened in the garden. And what I mean by that is God created a perfect state between man and him. And when you come to Christ, God, through Christ, takes you back. And Missy, it's just like you were walking with God before Adam and Eve sinned. That's where he wants you to go. 
He doesn't just want to change you right now in order to get you through the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years before he comes back. But he wants to take you back to a place to where you're standing in a right relationship with God and it's as though sin never took place, as though it never happened because the wages of sin has been paid for. Wow, that is so awesome. Turn to Genesis 3.15 for a moment. And here's what the scripture says. And I will put enmity. Now this is the first gospel. Okay? I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he shall bruise you on the head And you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, he was talking to the serpent. Now, I'm going to put something, Satan, between you and the seed of the woman. And he's ultimately going to totally destroy you. He's going to crush your head. All the way through the scripture, the head is a symbol of authority. Okay? So what... Right, again, right out of the gate, Genesis 3, you're only in the third chapter, and God has already looked down through time, and he said, I I really wanted you to live in perfection, Adam and Eve. I gave you a tree of life that you could live eternally like this, but you chose not to live like that, so you ate of the tree of knowledge because you wanted to be like me. And I had to banish you from the garden And I can't let you back in there. And because of that sin and that rebellion, that's going to be passed down to all of your generations. But I've already looked down time, and I've said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide a redeemer. And you may bruise him, because you're going to end up putting him on the cross, because he's got to die for sin. But he is going to crush you. And you have no more authority. Listen to me. Please hear this. Because this is where Christians have got to stand up and understand a principle. All right? When Jesus died on the cross, that scripture in Genesis 3.15 was fulfilled. Did you hear me? It was fulfilled. When Jesus died, the authority that Satan had in this realm, that authority that he tries to exercise over you, had been crushed. It's been destroyed. Satan doesn't have any authority over you at all because you now are in Christ. This word has been fulfilled. And you can walk as a child of God with your head high knowing that this prophetic word right at the very get-go has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So he's letting us know right away everything that's being done is in order for you to have that right kind of relationship. Now, I can't go into all the details. Obviously, the way that I teach is not going to be four weeks. It'll be... 40 weeks, okay? Uh, So, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, Why is it important, all right? Why is it important to understand that it would be the seed of the woman and not the seed of man? Obviously, we're going to find out later uh, when uh, Isaiah 14 tells us that a young virgin girl will bring forth a child, all right, whose name will be called Emmanuel. Now, there's a, there's a, a, a line of thought out there that that didn't mean a virgin girl, but it meant a girl of young marriageable age. But all the research and all the antiquities of the word says it was a young girl, a virgin girl. And then we go into the book of Luke, and the angel of the Lord appears unto, unto Mary, and so, Mary, this is, that's going to take place and happen in you is not by man, 
but it's by the Holy Spirit. Look at what the Spirit is doing. The Spirit moves over the face of the earth and it causes everything to be. Now the Spirit, we're going to find out that the prophecy is the Spirit is also going to move upon a woman and she's going to bring forth a child, a seed, and that seed is going to destroy the authority of the enemy. That's pretty, pretty powerful. But why is that important? So why is it important? And this is a question for you, and I want some answers. Why is it important that you and I in Christianity today, why is it so important for you and I to believe in a virgin birth? Because there's many churches today that are, are not believing in it anymore. They're saying it's irrelevant. No, it's not irrelevant. Had to be born sinless. Okay? All throughout the book of Hebrews, there's going to be a better sacrifice. The bulls and the goats are, are offered twice a day. There's an offering in the temple twice a day. Uh, then once a year, the sin offering and uh, all the different uh, festivals and the different uh, feast days. And it's over and over and over. And the writer says that you could spill the blood of goats and bulls and pigeon turtle doves or whatever over and over and over and over and over. And at best you get is you get forgiveness for a year. Yeah. Then it's got to be done all over again. Now what did in Zechariah and Zephaniah, God, and I'm trying to give you a lot of information but not too much, okay? Uh, in Zephaniah and Zechariah, the scripture says, I have something against the priest. They're offering undefiled, or defiled rather, sacrifices. Now, what they did is they would take the sacrifice, they would open it up just like you were getting ready to gut a fish or a deer, and they would open it up and they would put their hands in there and they would have to be looking for tumors and lesions or any of those kind of things that would have made this sacrifice defiled. All right, couldn't have a broken bone, couldn't have blemishes. It had to be pure. That's why Jesus had to be born of the virgin birth because the damn nature's sin passed down through the male seed would not be passed down to him. So when he was a sacrifice on the cross for you and I, he was a sinless, pure sacrifice for you and I because that was the only thing that God could accept. So it does have an enormous bearing of why we believe in a virgin birth. Because otherwise, Christ's sacrifice on the cross would not have been good enough. Because he would have had sin in his life because of Adam. And that's why it's important for all of us to come to Christ. We're born into this world, but we're born with this rebellious, sinless nature in our life. And that has to be submitted unto God and given back to God. Wrinkle. Blemish. Amen. Amen. So we're looking at the first man and woman. We're looking at the first sin. Then we're looking at the first gospel, the prophetic word, John, uh, Genesis 3, 15. And then we're looking at the first family, Adam and Eve. They had children to provide for a future development of the race of man who must contend with the efforts of the enemy um, who is trying to keep man from being restored unto God. Who are the, who are the two brothers? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Who killed who? Cain killed Abel. And then there was somebody else that was born. Who was the third? Who? Seth. Seth, Seth came in, and he basically meant a, a loose interpretation of his name as a replacement. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, isn't that amazing? Now, let me ask you, Yeah, maybe not. I'll, I'll wait a later on that one because that one can open up a lot of stuff. 
And uh, I'm not ready for Odell yet. All right, so the first family. Then what happened? The first what? The first murder. Cain killed Abel. All right? The, the blood of the martyr cries out from the ground. So now, in, in this first file box, I want you, without looking at your notes and your book for a moment, we had the first what? In the very beginning I, that we're talking about tonight. First man and woman. First who said sin? First sin. First what? First family. First what? First gospel. First family. And first what? All right. So the easy way to remember that is just simply they were the first. All right. So when you fill in your notes, you begin to understand under C, we're looking at the first man and woman, first sin, first gospel, first family, first murder, and then we're looking at the great flood. Can you imagine preaching for a hundred and whatever, 120 years or something like that? And nobody listening to you? Does that sound like today? Can you imagine that, Mary? Mary? Nobody listening to you for 120 years. All right, be careful when you look at your spouse. <laughs> All, right. All right. Nobody listen. They'd never seen rain. They didn't know what rain was. It's going to rain. The whole world's going to be flooded. You got a chance to come into the ark of safety. Eh, it's just a crazy old preacher. Ain't nothing going to happen. Oh, it would rain. What are you talking about? What's rain? But guess what? It happened. It happened. Now, how in the world? John, I've tried to, I I've, can't calculate it, but I've tried to figure out over all the years how the animals just simply knew to go to the boat, two by two. I mean, I mean if I, you know, I'll put it this way. Spirit moved on them. I'll put it to you this way. If I saw Nancy going toward the boat and there was another whatever animal next to her, no, you better know I want that place, okay? That's mine, all right? So I don't know what was going on, okay? All I know is God basically said it's time, and I'm sure Moses is probably standing on, on the ark, just looked out, and all of a sudden, here they come, all right? You know what that does for me? Let me tell you what that does for me. I look at all of the people that we pray for all the time, your sons, your daughters, your, your spouses, your, your loved ones, your relatives. And it looks like we've been praying over and over and over. And there's sometimes there's just something in saying, you go like, God, is it ever going to happen? And then all of a sudden, just, just like Noah, we open our eyes one day and we see, whoa, here they come. What a power of confidence that we should have. That in that right due season, God is going to call our sons and daughters home and our spouses home. And they're coming. Wow. See, that's the, the power of the scriptures. For me, the power of the word is when I am able to apply it to my everyday life. It's one thing for me to know that God called the animals together. But it's another thing, John, for me to know that one day he will keep his promise to me and he will bring my sons and daughters home. See, I, 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 I can use that every day to get over discouragement. I can use that every day to get over, over the hump, okay, of a bad day that I know that my God will not fail me. 
and he'll keep his promises. And my children, my sons and daughters will come home. So God determines to wipe out his creation and begin it all over again. All mankind perishes except for eight people who under the leadership of righteous Noah have remained true to God, who provides his rainbow promises as the water recedes. Wow, has the symbol of that rainbow ever changed? It was given as God's promise. I'll never do this again. And now it's symbolized and it's made to symbolize something that would be an abomination unto God. But that's what man does. Man distorts the word. And he uses whatever he can for his own purpose and his own convenience. And then ultimately, the last part of this is the Tower of Babel. Man attempts to climb to an elevation equal to God himself. Now, this is what's really incredible. <laughs> Nimrod, who is in charge at this time, and his name means a hunter, and Nimrod basically says, well, you destroyed the whole earth by a flood, and you're telling us to go into all the different parts of the country and begin to multiply and replenish the earth, populate it again. But God, I'm not going to go anywhere. Well, that's a pretty rebellious spirit, ain't it? No, I don't want to go nowhere. I want to stay right where I am. I'm comfortable. How many of you have ever gotten pretty comfortable where you're at spiritually? And sometimes when we get so comfortable spiritual, God's got to rock our world just a little bit and say, get out of your comfort zone. Everything's great. They all speak in the same language. They're all together. Everything's great. We're not going to go anywhere. And by the way, God, I don't know how big you really think that you are. I know you flooded everything, but you know what? I'm going to build a tower so tall that there ain't no amount of water that could ever flood us again. We'll always be able to reach to the mountaintop, to the top. And you're not going to be able to flood us anymore. Well, that's pretty arrogant, isn't it? But isn't it like man to get arrogant with God when he thinks he's holding the chips? We're all together. We, we, we we're speaking one common language. And, and, and I like what the scripture says because the scripture says that God tells the Godhead, he says, you know what? You see what they're doing down there? We've got to go down there and do something or they will do what they set out to do. They'll accomplish it. Now that should let you know that we as a people and we as a church, if we put forth our mind and we put forth our effort and we put forth our unity and we release the spirit of God that's on the inside of us, we can do everything that God wants us to do. We can conquer this lake area for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they're just, they're bent on doing it their way, so God says, I've got a plan. I think I'm going to go down there and I'm going to stir it up just a little bit. It's kind of like all of a sudden everybody started speaking in tongues, but they started speaking in a different tongue. And they didn't understand anybody no more. How can I ask you to pass me the hammer when my term hammer doesn't mean what your term does? So they, they, they couldn't work together. Yeah, that's it, huh? What'd you say? So now all of a sudden they can't work. And they can't build the tower because they can't understand each other. Now, can I give you a, a real golden nugget? A really golden nugget. Super gold. You can't outsmart God. <laughs> you, just, you can't do it. 
All right. And you can take that one to the bank. So they get all divided. The language is confused. So what, what do you do? Well, what would be the next thing to do? These people speak one kind of a language, so they take off in that direction. These people speak this language. They take off in that direction. God does what he said he did. He told them to disperse to begin with. And they said, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to do it our way, and we're going to do what we want to do. And God says, I told you to disperse, and you're going to disperse. You can either do it the easy way, or you can do it the hard way. They chose the hard way. And now look at us. Nancy and I living in uh, Los Angeles area, Riverside. 115 different languages spoken in the school system. 115 languages spoken in the school system. I don't even know how many languages there are. There's thousands. I go to the Philippines, I know, I know there we've got hundreds and hundreds of dialects. If I go to uh, Nigeria, there's three basic uh, language groups, but then there's tons and tons of different dialects. And I've been in places to where I can be right here, and they speak Higanonan uh, in the Philippines, and I can go to the next village, and they speak Manobo. And they're just a a stone throw away from each other. Wouldn't it be awesome if we all just spoke the same language? Sure make it a lot easier. What? It would be a heavenly language. I believe that's one of the reasons for tongues. I really do. And, uh, but anyhow, okay. So here with creation, as we get ready to summarize it, the creation file is the story of God's creating a man, his fall, uh, God's plan to save mankind, um, the relationship uh, between uh, the family, the murder, and ultimately the flood and the rainbow and the Tower of Babel. Right. So, without your notes in front of you. <laughs> How many, who, can, who wants to try that? Uh, without your notes. Dustin, give me one of them. <laughs> First what? First man and woman. Okay. Mark? Yeah. He got it in order. <laughs> All right. First sin. First gospel. First gospel. Somebody else? First family. Now oh, you're reading your notes now. You can't read your notes. Stop that. All right. First, first murder. All right. Then what happened? Flood. Flood and rainbow. And then the last one was? Tower of Babel. All right. You have went through, right now you have went through most of Genesis 1 through probably about 7 to 8, somewhere in that ballpark, that that's what you have just covered in this creation period. And when we look next at Abraham, we're going to cover a lot more territory. Um, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Isaac is not mentioned a lot in the scripture. We know that he was the promised son he was the seed that ultimately the promise would pass to, not Ishmael. And uh, we know he was, his dad offered him, uh, was prepared to offer him as a sacrifice in the mountaintop. And we know that he was deceived by his two sons, okay? And uh, so as we go through the scriptures and through the word, we'll find out more and more of what God is doing planning for us. And all the way through this, you're going to see things from the New Testament. All right? The Old Testament was a schoolmaster to bring us to an understanding of Christ. And the best way I've always tried to present it 
God has always had a people. He has a people. He will always have the people, a people. And the difference that separates those people is before, in the Old Testament, we were one of those people because of our family. We were of the, one of the 12 tribes. My father was Abraham, or my father was Esau, or my father was Jacob, or whatever. So the way to God was through your lineage and your heritage. The New Testament, he still has a people, but your way to him now has nothing to do with your genealogy. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ and what he did for you upon the cross. All right, same God still has a people that's never changed, but now it's called continuity and discontinuity. Okay, the continuity is that he's always had a people. The discontinuity is how we become one with him now. No more by heritage, but now by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's your first session. Now, I want you to keep reading. Uh, 19, uh, because we're going to get to the Abraham covenant. We covered that quite a bit uh, the other night, but we will talk about that. So I would say... Yeah. 19 through 24. That'll, that'll get us covered. I hope that you're enjoying this. I love teaching it, okay? I just, I love doing it. Uh, but I want to make sure that you're enjoying it. I don't want you to be bored or just like, whoa, that's way too much stuff for me. I don't want it. Because if this is, then when we get to Josh McDowell, uh, man, you're going to have to... He'll scratch your head uh, because he's going to really talk to us about a lot of things, proving the word of God and the authenticity. Because I want you to be able to hold your Bible, Amber, and know that the scriptures that you have are real and they're as close to what was written 2,000 years ago. And when people tell me all the time, well, it's been changed, or I don't mean that, or man did that, no, no, that's not true. Because they've proven, documented, that it's just as real now as it was 2,000 years ago. And that he'll have all the details. All right, God love you and God bless you. Let's all stand. <coughs> Ladies, thank you for watching in Galveston. All right. Appreciate it. Hope you're having a great time. See you Sunday, some of you. Um, all right, Mark, you want to dismiss us tonight? We agree. We agree.